think this is my happiest day at Cathedral of Hope because I'm uh, introducing you to someone who is so dear to me. I, I, words fail me, really. Uh, my sister, and I mean that in every aspect of the word, uh, and someone that I've worked with in ministry for many years, nearly 30 years. We don't look old enough to have known each other that long, but, you know, <laughs> clean living. It's that Pentecostal living, that holiness lifestyle, I know. And I've known her in her years as, uh, initially she began her ministry as a, also a recording artist uh, at the Love Center in Oakland, which is the, the mother church of gospel music, I, I think it's fair to say, at least in the western part of the country, yes. Uh, but Yvette went on to start City of Refuge Church, which would be a church where all same gender loving people could be themselves, a self-determined church and a spiritual home. Pentecostal, uh, largely African-American, I have always felt there more at home than I even felt in the church I grew up in. And if you ever go to Oakland, you must worship there. Uh, you will not uh, regret it. It's a United Church of Christ congregation. And Yvette's ministry was so, such a model that she began a, a denomination or a fellowship called Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, largely gay, largely black, largely Pentecostal churches, many of which also belong to the United Church of Christ. So I'm just saying you could belong to the United Church of Christ and also belong to fellowship, even if you were not necessarily as integrated yet as you want to be and as spirit-filled as you might want to be. You still could be like Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ, slash Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. Just, just saying, for no particular reason, because sometimes you never know, right? Yvette is a civic leader in San Francisco and nationally. Uh, whenever there are uh, occasions when the White House wants to tap into particular communities, she's on speed dial. And it's true, she's had an influence in policy and all those levels. Here's what I know to be true and why I trust her so much. She's a person of complete integrity. Who you see is who she is and who you'll experience shortly is who she is. I've always been able to tell her whatever I need to, the truth, the truths, the painful truths, and know that I will be met with unconditional love and also stern reproof if I need it. Uh, she does both of those things. And you can trust her. This is how I know. She said, Jim, let's go to Zimbabwe. And I said, not, ah, Zimbabwe, are you sure? Uh, have you read the newspaper lately? Uh, but uh, she said, yes, Zimbabwe. And she took me and others there to the most beautiful place on earth, the mother of peace, HIV AIDS orphanage in Matuko. Who knew that there was this lovely refuge there uh, in a very painful situation? And Yvette's, this is part of Yvette's vision. This is how she touches the world. It's not just local, it's not just national, it's global, and it's personal and transformational too. So I love Yvette, and I hope that you will too. Thank you for being here. It is good to be here. I have always the disclaimer to make that I am a Pentecostal again. And uh, as I say often, I have no concept of time. And so I've been told by my sister and brethren that the 11 o'clock service allows the preacher a little more preaching time. That probably wasn't a good thing to tell me. <laughs> so I'll still be mindful that you haven't had lunch. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be here. It's good to be home. Texas is home for my family. I'm the first generation born out of Texas in California. And I'm uh, born and raised in San Francisco, and I have a Texas accent. How about that? And I, I love ham hocks and butter beans. <laughs> Greens and hot water cornbread. Amen. Fried chicken. There will be chicken in heaven. <laughs> because it is called paradise. Let me say also that I am so grateful to have my partner and spouse. You know, we got married when Marion was available the first time in California. But we don't celebrate that anniversary. The one we celebrate is the one that God gave us as our union together 
30 years ago. And I'm so grateful that she is here and well and healthy. We are blessed to have two daughters, a niece of Shirley's that I raised and we raised together, and my birth daughter, and we have two grandsons who are perfect in every way. <laughs> and even when they're wrong. <laughs> I'm so grateful for City of Refuge. I'm so grateful for Living Faith Covenant Church here in Dallas, Texas, and Pastor Marvin, Bishop Alex. We just came off of three or four days of conferencing for the southern region over which Bishop Alex Bird presides. And we've had a great, great time. And it is so good to be here at Cathedral of Hope and to have known you in many of your iterations and to see you going into your bright tomorrow, to watch you getting ready for your what's next is exciting to me. And I want you to know I am organically connected to you. I am your sister, and there's really nothing at all you can do about it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So it is good to be here, good to be with you. Done some dangerous work with Jim Matulski in San Francisco, in Atlanta, various parts of the world, in Zimbabwe, all over Africa where we work. And our fellowship has grown now to include 14 churches in Asia. And I'm just so grateful to see God moving in such a powerful way. I ask you, or say this to you, to ask you to keep us in your prayers and thoughts as we continue to expand the reach where folks are getting a polluted understanding of the scandalous gospel of Jesus Christ. The scandalous gospel that would dare really say that all can come to the table. And I encourage your prayers for us. I'm moved today by a conversation that we are having in many places about what is happening with young people from South America and from Mexico, and what is happening with young people who are caught between the crossfire from the Jewish folks and the Palestinian folks. And I cannot imagine young people being killed and buried. I cannot imagine young people being set on fire simply because the elder people are struggling with what I have come to call the either-or God. I believe that it is a skewed God view that gives people permission at times to do the evil things that we do to one another. It's amazing what we can do when we think that God is on our side. It's an incredibly sad thing to see our young people caught in that place, and it moves me to share with you a little bit about what I believe to be the either-or God bowing to what I have come to call the both-and God. In Genesis, the 16th chapter, and the 7th through the 10th verse, I'll read just a little bit of the account in Genesis 16 and 21 of the slave woman, Hagar, who was the slave to Abraham and Sarah, and also the mother of Abraham's firstborn, Ishmael. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, this after she had left Abraham and Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said, Hagar, maid of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And then the angel of the Lord said, and I will so greatly multiply your descendants that they cannot be numbered for multitude. She went back and then God spoke again and she left again. And God spoke to her on her second sojourn and said, I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman because he is your offspring. And Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, put it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. She departed to the land of Beersheba. 
Then a little further down, when the water was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes and she went and sat down over against him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look upon the death of my child. And as she sat over against him, the child lifted up his voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him fast in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. This promise to Hagar, the slave woman, and her child. In my most recent reading of scripture, I seem to be drawn two examples of what I have come to call the both and as versus the either or God. Perhaps it is because I have grown weary of the constant and senseless violence touted as righteousness and perpetuated in the name of God. In Uganda, in Cameroon, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, there are draconian laws that demonize, vilify, and objectify LGBT people and encourage corrective rape, prosecute family and friends, and put people in jail for up to 15 years, not just for being gay, but for knowing that someone is gay and not turning them in. And much of that negative influence comes from the hatred spewing what I come to call Christian jihadists here in the United States, who, by the way, are now saying because of his support for us in so many ways that President Obama is gay. I heard that just the other day. I didn't know that. I know him well. He didn't tell me that. I don't know. <laughs> But thank God that Congresswoman Barbara Lee and the Congressional Black Caucus have spoken out loud about the injustice perpetrated against people of African descent on the continent of Africa because they are gay or are friendly, are allies, are supporters, or family members of LGBT people. One of the sad truths that I don't like to admit particularly in an audience where most of my brothers and sisters are of European descent. One of the great sorrows that I have is that the African-American church and our principal leaders are conspicuously quiet about this injustice on the continent of Africa. And it troubles me in places where I can't even openly describe to you. I will say to you this, that it suggests that we have been colonized ourselves by a certain hatred of ourselves. Either you do what I say, the either or people say, either you do what I say, you believe what I believe, you support what I support, or you become my enemy, and anyone who is my enemy is God's enemy. That's an incredibly sad reality but that's the way that it has been taught to us. And we have learned it so internally, it's almost written on our DNA. It's troubling to me that this both and God that we celebrated already in this service today is not widely accepted and appreciated in religious circles. Seems that the foundation of much of what we hear today from religious influence circles is encouraging polarization and separatism. Oh, you hear it. We're on our way into another election cycle, and here we go. Listen to it, it's everywhere. Here we go. Here we go. I turn on Fox News for entertainment. Here we go. Here we go. It's almost predictable. You know what's going to be said as soon as something happens. It comes down to now you have to choose your side. Agree with your folks, even when you disagree deep in your soul. 
It's as though you cannot have an opinion of your own. If your group is saying it, then you have to say it. If you're red stated, you have to say red stated stuff. If you're blue stated, you have to say blue stated stuff. Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you a creationist? They say intelligent designers now. Are you an evolutionist? Are you a Protestant? Are you a Catholic? Are you a oneness Pentecostal or a Trinitarian Pentecostal? Are you straight or are you gay? Because you know, bye, we don't, we don't support that. So are you straight <laughs> or are you gay? Do you side with the Jews? Are you with the Palestinians? Are you for abortion? Are you for choice? And what about Obamacare? How you feel about that? And how you come down on it determines which club you're in. And God forbid that you are a person who chooses to pick a little bit of this and that and have your own opinion and not have your opinion determined by a group of people. <laughs> Question comes up again and again, are you with us? Are you against us? Make up your mind. Conservatives line up over here. Liberals, line up over here. You have to go with the whole kahuna, the whole full Monty, if you're going to be in our club. You can't be duly affiliated. Pick a side, and don't be found over in the enemy's camp. See, the both and God does not play well in a fundamentalist atmosphere, whether that fundamentalist atmosphere is liberal or conservative, you know? There's such thing as a liberal fundamentalist. Well, all right. It doesn't play well. It doesn't play well. And it is a message often not lifted up from Scripture. We don't read that, but it is there. It is essential, however, because so much of the present and historical hostility in the world is rooted in our God view. I am watching candidates now Get in the God view gamut, the God gamut. People are asking, well, what kind of church did they come from? What is their belief system like? I was amazed that a Mormon ever got close to the White House. And I remember that there was an interview down in Florida when there was, and of course they picked a man that had no teeth in the front, no teeth in the top, no teeth in the bottom. And they said, well, tell us, what do you think about Obama? He said, well, <laughs> Obama is a Muslim. He know he a Muslim. Why don't he just admit it? <laughs> and the question, and it begs the question, and so what if he is a Muslim? What in the world difference does it make? Let me say it again. What if he is a Muslim? What in the world difference does it make? And it brings up for me this continued question of how can a Christian be an anti-Semitic? How do we pull that off? Jesus was a Jew. A Jew. Born a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day a Jew, raised a Jew, went to the temple, prayed a Jew, stood up in the temple, read from the scroll of Isaiah, as a Jew, died a Jew, never was a Christian. <laughs> but our God view separates us and defines who has the real, full, intact truth of God. I'm a Christian. Well, how were you baptized? Did they sprinkle? Did they dunk? Did they pour? Were you a baby? Had you had confirmation? Did you name the name of Jesus Christ? Did you speak in tongues? I have to test all of that to see if I can believe in the validity of your baptism. This is what we do to each other. We Methodist, Baptist, Costa, Catholic, Angler, Episcopalians. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. Religion 
Religious fundamentalism suggests that God has been fully revealed to somebody. And the, everybody <laughs> believes they have a full revelation of God. Every faith teaches this is the full intact revelation of God. And that is why religion is so violent. Because we who know believe that because we know whoever believes differently by default is fundamentally flawed. And it's not a far cry from my believing that you don't have the real truth to being able to shoot you for it. It's not a far cry. People are killing people because they believe they are doing God a favor. Who is this God? Who is this both and God? Religious fundamentalism suggests that God has been fully revealed and we know who God is, all of what God wants, how God moves, and other people don't know what we know. We can make that mistake as liberals and often disconnect ourselves from people who are in another way of thinking. It's important to understand this is why good Christian folks in this part of the world, in this state some years ago, when it was very different between your mothers and fathers, some of you, and my mothers and fathers, when I couldn't stand in a place like this, and when good Christian folks could get together and they could sing a hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, go outside, have a picnic, and lynch someone for entertainment. It's incredible, in the name of God and for the cause of God, that the Ku Klux Klan could have been a religious organization whose moniker, whose symbol was the cross of Jesus Christ. That's incredible to me that such a thing is possible, but it is possible when good Christian folk somehow ascribe to the teaching of an either or other than. You see, when you don't hold on to a both and God, you can get in a camp. And when you get in that camp, you can decide whoever's not in the camp is not of God. Good Christian folk. This explains why a young man could be forced to give his name and summarily be beheaded by his executioners while they cry, Allah, Akbar, God is great. God is great. God is great. Or a young woman can be buried in the dirt up to her neck and stoned to death simply because she falls in love with a young man from another Muslim sect. Both of them are Muslim but they are different kinds of Muslims, and her family, her family and her community took her life. And that right now, we have young people being killed, some by young people, both of which suggesting that they know God, God by another name, but still God, killing in the name of God. How sad is that? And where did they get that example from? Where did they learn that behavior, brothers and sisters? Where do, what kind of teaching are we giving to the world to suggest that any of us has that kind of corner on God? Presidential candidates gearing up, running the God gambit, using these children as a political plank who are incarcerated now in the United States because they are coming here, some of them, to try to find work so that they can take care of families in Mexico and South America. It is an incredible reality for us in this time. I know about the either or God. I know about binary constructs like right and wrong, black and white, and heaven and hell, and in and out. That's the way I was raised, I told you. I was raised as a fundamentalist Pentecostal, where we start to find one answer to all things theological. And we had some tough stuff to try to figure out. Like, where did the dinosaurs come from? <laughs> Somebody, and if one while we thought that the devil put the bones in the ground. Anybody understand what I'm saying? <laughs> just, just to confuse the church, you understand what I mean. It was complicated. You know, when Cain left Adam 
and Eve and went and got married, who was that he married? Who was that? It was his sisters, like God forbid. That's, <laughs> so how did that happen? We had lots of questions that we needed to answer, and so we had to try to find one answer to all the difficult questions, and if we didn't know the answer, we listened at night on the radio to the Bible Answer Man, and he had told us what were the answers to the difficult questions, and I listened carefully to him, because by the time I was about 22, 23 years old, Jim, I knew everything. <laughs> everything. Every single thing. And I was so glad to be able to tell you when you asked me questions what the answers were. And I said it with authority because, of course, I knew everything. <laughs> and the older I get, and the older I get, the less I seem to know. It seems I don't have the clear, definitive answers that I once had. In fact, I find that I have more questions than I have answers. But I'm happier than I've ever been because I realize that there are many more questions and many more answers to come. And that I am not required. I tell you, the thing I like to say the most these days is I don't know. <laughs> so, well, what, what do you think about it? I don't know. <laughs> well, are you a premillennialist or postmillennialist? Well, I don't know. <laughs> are we gonna have the, the grand table? Supper of the Lamb, this is eschatological talk. Are, are, are we gonna, is, is Jesus coming soon and gonna blow the whole thing to hell? Child, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He might have come already. I don't know. All I can tell you is that I know I belong to God and that God belongs to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's reason enough for me to rejoice in ways that I don't even have words to describe. Let me go a little further and say that once I found the right way and I realized that my right way was right for me, I allowed others to go the way that was right for them. Hallelujah. I thought once before that God only honored my creed and my canon and my saints and my miracles and my dogma and my signs and wonders, my church culture, my worship style, my mode of expression. I really believe that God really clapped on the two and the four <laughs> and danced the Pentecostal dance and spoke in tongues and that God personified as God the mother would, would have a big church hat on. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? And I believe that any deviation from what I believed suggested that a person was substandard. But I'm amazed as I grow and evolve theologically that I'm as uncertain as I am. I can feel in myself, inside of myself, the ability to accept and receive all my stuff. And I'll say it again. If I were in a Pentecostal church, I'd encourage you to say to your neighbor, I want all my stuff. So just for a minute, tell your neighbor I want all my stuff. Now, I've got some stuff, and there's some stuff that I would have missed if I didn't go after all my stuff. I'm a Cherokee, and I'm Irish, and I'm from West Africa. I know that much about myself. And all of those things going on inside me at the same time, and much of that has been colonized out of me, demonized and vilified. But I'll say it again, I'm a Cherokee, and I'm from West Africa, and I'm Irish. How about that? <laughs> Run tell somebody I said it. I'm Irish and Cherokee, and, and, and the truth is, all of those cultures like the drum. That explains a lot. <laughs> and when I hear it, and, I, and I can get, when I go to Africa and I watch the folks move, I say, that's where I got that from. So that's working for me, and I, I watch Cherokee people dance, and, and, I can, and they do that thing when they dip in like this. I say, see, I understand that, because I come from that. It's kind of like the wobble, you know? Anybody understand what I mean? That works for me. And my faith path is influenced by it. My faith path is influenced by all of those traditions coming together, but I was taught to demonize and vilify my African self. 
I was taught to demonize and vilify. But you see, we'll never be whole people until we get all our stuff first. Then we can let other people have their stuff. And then we can put our stuff together. And imagine what kind of stuff we'll have when all of our stuff gets together at one time. Let me move this along. I'm enjoying this adventure. I'm having a ball. I'm enjoying being able to touch my Yoruba roots. I'm enjoying being able to understand that God was doing something before 2,000 years ago. I'm enjoying being able to, in, to experience my, and, and, and to be able to believe that that reality exists because there is a common Christ. Oh, I'm having a Pentecostal moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is a common Christ, the anointed one that covers all things that are of the divine. And that common Christ is the same Cherokee Christ and the same Jewish Christ and the same Yoruba Christ and the same Lugumi Christ and the same Santeria Christ and the same Catholic Christ and the same Lutheran Christ and the same Methodist Christ and the same Christ that loves the earth, the same pagan Christ. How incredible is that reality that God could actually be that big and that broad and that great and that open. How incredible is that? What a blessing that is. What a blessing to know that, to sense that and to let that course through us. And we won't be stuck in any particular anything because it's bigger. And I said the other day, there are 40,000 planets, they say, in our solar system that have water, which means they can have life. So we could have some sisters and brothers with six arms and 12 eyes somewhere. <laughs> Hallelujah. And who knew but that God perhaps incarnated God's self and visited them. And maybe one day when we get where we're going, we'll be awesomely surprised at how big our God really is and how great our God really is. Let me move on. I got stuck, I'm sorry. Either or folks who believe in an either or God seem to have more clarity about what they believe because they distill it down into a little something. Oh, you hear me? And they all speak the same thing. You ever go on the television and listen during a political campaign and everybody says the same thing. They say the same thing because they get together and talk about what they hate and they say the same thing. Both and folks have a bit of difficulty doing that because there are so many different ways, so many different expressions, but we need to find our common denominator too. And if our common denominator is nothing more, hallelujah, than that we love each other. We have lived to learn that you can love the hell out of anybody. <laughs> and if, if we can come together on that, that in and of itself will change the world and change the message that God has for the world. And let me end with this. Many examples of the both and heart of God in the scripture is evidenced in the life of Jesus and the apostles. Jesus spoke on more than one occasion about other sheep that I have. Mary sat down in the living room, reclining on pillows with the men while Jesus taught at her home in Bethany. And Martha hollered from the kitchen, girl, have you lost your mind? <laughs> Come back in the kitchen, that is not your place. Jesus said, leave her alone. She's chosen the better part. And Paul told the Galatians that in Christ we are neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. God is not stuck with having to bless one communion and curse another, bless one baptism and curse another. So I lifted up this example in the Hebrew Bible for your consideration. Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl who ran away, chapter 17, and was run away in chapter 21. Because as the mother of Abraham's first child, she and her son were a great aggravation to Sarah. Abraham and Sarah were promised Isaac, but what of Ishmael? 
And I need for that to resonate in your spirit today. What of Ishmael? Some people suggest he was a contingency plan, something that went wrong and therefore he was expendable. Can God bless the offspring of Hagar and the offspring of Sarah at the same time? Can God bless your family and my family at the same time? Can God bless straight and gay folks at the same time? Can God bless Americans and folks who aren't American and are angry with America at the same time? Can God bless you and your adversary at the same time? Will God bless people even if we don't want God to? And when God does, do we get the Jonah depression? When he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was afraid God was going to bless his enemy. Well, what are we going to do if God blesses who we don't like? Because God's blessing us and some folk don't like us. Hello, what are we going to do? Is it really possible that our God is the God of Christians in all of our many manifestations and Jews and Muslims and the many others who are not in the big three, anybody hear me? Whose minds and hearts seek the divine, hallelujah. There's no telling what God may do next. Hold on to your hair weave. No telling what God may do next. Remember this, my beloved. There were two trees in the garden. One for the knowledge of good and evil, according to the creation story in the Hebrew Bible. The other was a tree of life. Religion is stuck at the wrong tree. The question should not be what is good and what is evil, because the answer is relative to where you are theologically in your growth and who you are in the equation and whether it's going to work for you. Is killing wrong? Some people say, yes, it's wrong, and will heartily support an unjust war and capital punishment at the same time, right? There are some who say that we believe in this, but then secretly they believe something else. Folks who tend the tree of right and wrong are the ones with power. But let me say something to you they tended the wrong tree. There's another tree in the garden, and it is the tree of life. And the real question about where we ought to be is, does this thing bring life? You see, that's the only good that religion has in the earth. If it's not healing anybody, what is it for? When they got ready to consecrate me a bishop, and all of my colleagues and all of the pastors that we serve with, they got together and said, we're going to do your consecration. We're going to do your consecration, and they gave me, you haven't seen me in my drag. I got some drag for this. I got some full-on drag. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I got the hat, and I got, the, I got all kind of stuff. Just, I'm telling you, you ought to see me. I'm short, but I got a lot of stuff, a lot of my stuff on. And I said, so you're going to consecrate me. I have one question. If after I become a bishop, will I be better able to get people off crack? And somebody said to me, well, what has that got to do with it? So then I want to know, what has the consecration got to do with my ability to help people move from where they are to deliver them from stigma and to return them to productivity? Because if that kind of change does not exist, then you can keep all the robes, do you hear me? And you can keep all the hats and the rings. You can keep all the bells and smells. If we are not able to really help people shift and change, then we are in the business of religion. We are not doing the work of the common Christ. And I'm almost through. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me end with this. You may call me, me naive, say, well, you really don't get it. You don't understand. But for me, a glimpse of the reign of God is one where we can appreciate all baptisms, the pours, the dunkers, and the sprinklers, all communions and Eucharists and extended families adopted straight and gay, holy writ, whether it's, whether it's Quran or it's the scripture as we understand it, whether it's the one that we've canonized or the one that's apocryphal or the one that's pseudepigraphal, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. There's enough truth in all of them to help us stop killing each other. 
All prayers, spontaneous and liturgical, all people seeing each other, knit together like a quilt into one family of God. All of us on a journey together, listening to the still speaking God. To me, that's religious evolution, and I'm an evolutionary, where we don't have to be the same thing to mind the same things, where any war in the family is a civil war, and where all the children are safe. Can I leave this with you? There is a notion of paradise that says that the lion lays down with the lamb. For the lion and lamb, but by the way, this is not natural. It ain't natural. <laughs> For a lion and lamb, because one of them eats the other. <laughs> Anybody hear me? For the lion to lay down with the lamb means that the lion has to divest him or herself of its predatory nature. And the lamb must divest itself of its tendency to be a victim. That's when paradise happens. And I'm saying to you, my beloved, we are looking for a day when all the children are safe because all the children are our children, where we seek to find connections, not disconnections, where we blur our boundaries enough to recompose our decomposing churches and fellowships. Perhaps this is the vision of Martin Luther King's beloved community. And I see a group of brothers, Joseph's brothers, who were mad because he was a dreamer. But let me be a dreamer just for a minute and say to you that there's coming a day when all of God's children, black and white, rich and poor, straight and gay, in this country, a part of this empire and not. Those who vote one way and those who vote another. Those who believe in our understandings of God and those who believe in there's coming a day when all of us are going to understand and embrace the common love of God. Someone said that Jesus is coming, and when he comes, boy, is he pissed. <laughs> and he is going to straighten this whole thing out. But you know, I'm coming to believe that the only way this kingdom will come is that you and I must bring it in the ways in which we love one another. I pray. And I pray with all my heart that we will choose the both and God and demonstrate that reality in the earth until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. God bless you. It's my prayer.